So, Gospel of Luke, 10th chapter. What happened is the first 12, the first 12 begin to follow Jesus. They begin to follow Jesus. And then, and then suddenly, suddenly it says this. It says in the 10th chapter, it says that Jesus appointed 72. 72. So now there's 72 followers. There's 72 followers. This is the beginning of Christian community. This is that next step. And in this, in this scripture, you can see, if you have your Bibles, I'm not going to read it all, okay? I'm going to do like I did the other one and, and tell you what it's about. It's about Jesus. He said uh, he, he, he appointed the 72 others and sent them out two by two. That's significant. They were designed and created for community. He sent them out two by two, and they had a mission. He sent them out two by two, and, and, and he said uh, to go to every town and place where he was about to go. That's important. Jesus sent them out two by two and said, that, look, you're going to go into the villages and towns. I know where I'm going. You're going to go out and you're going to be the advance party. Does that make sense? You're going to go and invite people to be ready for me. You're going to go and invite people to be ready because I'm going to show up. Jesus is coming is basically what he's saying. And then the, the rest of this, this chapter are the instructions he gave. So, for example, he said, he said the harvest is heavy, but the workers are few. And, you know, a month or so ago I talked about that. I preached about that. And I said, I think harvest is the results. It's the blessings of God. And Jesus is saying, the blessings of God are many, and, and the workers are few. Therefore, send out workers into his harvest field. So Jesus says to these 72, now this includes the original 12 plus 60 more. And he says, go. I'm sending you out like lambs among the wolves. So do not take a purse or bag or sandals. Do not greet anyone on the road. You need to be focused, is what he's saying. Your business, your, get, get yourself to that village and get the people ready for me. Oh, and don't take any possessions along. You need to trust God. And he goes on and says, you know, when you enter, enter a house, uh, say peace to this house. Verse 6, when you enter a town and are welcomed, eat what is set before you. Heal the sick who are there and tell them the kingdom of God is near you. Again, this scripture goes on and Jesus gives them instructions of what to do what to do. And we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about that. In fact, this is important. I believe we've been building up to this to understand the process, to understand um, and, and to break it down in finer detail of what's going on. And it starts with this idea, you see, that even though it comes at the end of Matthew's gospel, the mission that Jesus put his followers on has never changed, ever. It hasn't changed to this day. And it's a mission for all people who follow Jesus, right? To, to make disciples who love God, love others, and serve the world. To make disciples, to invite people into the process. This has never changed. At the end of Matthew's <clears throat> gospel, when Jesus uh, was getting ready to ascend it into heaven after the resurrection, and Matthew records it as he says to his followers, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded you. And hey, don't worry, I'll be with you always. Again, I want to say, church, that mission <clears throat> has never changed. And, 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 and you see, it's, it's not that God just said, here's what you're supposed to do, now get to it. Roll up your sleeves and go make disciples. Here's the cool thing, and here's the wonderful thing, is that God also created a plan. God also created a plan not just to get people to heaven, and this is important that you hear that, not just to get people to heaven, not just to save people when they die that they go to heaven. But God's plan was this process to do that and to bring more of heaven on earth, the kingdom of God. You know, a lot of times when Jesus would teach, reading the gospel, and Jesus would say, the kingdom of God is like. And he wasn't just talking about eternal life, heaven. He was talking about right now. So see, God, God said, nope, here's the plan. Here's the plan. Through Jesus, God showed us the process. And I had Janelle create these graphics for me because, again, this is important. And, and it's going to become a, a next step for us as a, as a congregation, I believe, that we keep this always in front of us. Always in front of us. Is that God gave us this process, and it was modeled by Jesus. And it starts, it starts with invitation. That's what we just read about. That's what I read about, and, and, and Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all have accounts of the invitation that Jesus gave to the first 12, and that's what it was. Come and follow me. Come and follow me, and they did, and that's the next step in the process, is to begin that process of following Jesus as opposed to following something else or someone else. It's following Jesus, is invitation, and then come and follow, and so these first 12, they did. It says that they left their, their boats, they, um, and then they, they followed them. They left everything behind, right? 
They were fishermen. They had businesses. All this they left. And, and what happened? Well, literally they followed him, like probably walked down the road, went village to village. They traveled with Jesus and they ate meals with Jesus and they listened to Jesus and they probably sat and asked him questions around the campfire. You know, it's this thing, you know, you got to picture this first century, no cable TV, no Internet. You all with me? They had lots of time on their hands. OK, no, 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 no real big distractions. So these first 12, they followed Jesus and they they got to know him and they were known by him. And that's what was going on. It was the very first authentic Christian community. And that's the model. That's part of the process is what we're talking about. It's part of the process. They said yes to the invitation. They began to follow and they spent time. Literally, they spent time with Jesus getting to know him and him getting to know them, right? First authentic Christian community, first group of Jesus followers. But here's the thing. It didn't stop there. It didn't stop there. Just like we've said, it, it doesn't stop there. It's one thing to know or to give intellectual assent to something. But there's a point, you see, in Christianity and in our Christian faith that you have to go and do. you got to do something with it. You can't just sit in a room and learn all you can about Jesus, but never go and live such good lives among the pagans, as Peter said, that, that they want to glorify God. There's a point of going and doing, going and doing. The first group, it wasn't enough to just sit and watch. They had to go, and that's the next part of the process. Go and do something with the knowledge about Jesus. Go and do something because your perspective on life and the world has changed. Because your perspective about God has changed. Go and do something with the change of perspective and the change of head and the change of hearts and the change of habits. Go and do something. And so what was that something? Well, what happened next was Jesus and the twelve extended the process, you see, and there it is all together. They obviously, logically, had to extend the process, meaning that these 12, these 12 went and invited people to follow, to know and be known, to know Jesus and be known by Him, and to know one another in community, and then to go and do. And the next thing you know, there's 60 more people, and we have 72. Does that all make sense? Say yes. If you had a number on the front of your bulletin, stand up, please, if I could ask you to do that. If you had a number on the front of your bulletin, do you mind standing up, please? <clears throat> I want you to look around and, and keep standing. Okay, keep standing. Okay, I don't know if we got 72 standing up. This is one of those designs that comes about sitting behind my desk on a Wednesday, and it doesn't always mean it translates well to Sunday. Okay, here's why I'm having you stand up. As you begin to get an idea, you see these people, these first 12 and these 72 we're not like magic people. They weren't um, like, like all, all the same. They're like you and me. And it was 72. It was 72 that were part of the process. They'd been invited, follow, no, go and do. And so Jesus sent the 72 out. Please be seated. I just wanted that visual effect. Thank you for letting me use you. Okay. Plus you wanted to stand up for just a minute. Point. Point. This was the next step in creating the church. This was the next step in creating the living, breathing body of Christ that would be at work once Jesus left. Jesus said, go, go. He said to the 72, go two by two and prepare the people. He said, go and get people ready to meet Jesus, right? So you had the 60 plus 12 had been invited to follow. They were doing this. They were working this process and they went and they started working. And what were they doing? They were inviting people into the process of following Jesus. And church, here we are because of that. Think about that for a second. If those first 12 and if those next 60 had not been part of this process individually, and if they had not taken that crucial step to go and to do, to take their changed uh, heads and hearts and perspectives and the knowledge that they have about Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and salvation and forgiveness. If those 12 and then those 60 and then it just kept multiplying, if they had not done what they did all those thousands of years ago, we would not be here. You would not be here sitting in this place as part of a Christian congregation gathered to worship God. But you see, they did. They did. This last week, this last week, the big, the big uh, uh, American holiday, right, right up there with the Super Bowl, right up there with Christmas, was what? What was the big holiday? Tuesday. Halloween. Yep, Halloween. It's bigger every year, doesn't it? I think the adults are taking it over. The adults are taking over. At least in my neighborhood, they, they, people like, I guess they use it to walk around in public and drink beer and not be arrested. Is that, or is that just my, 
That's what I observed in my neighborhood. Like, what? What? Don't throw the cans on my yard. Keep going. Keep moving. Anyway. But you know, the bigger holiday, the bigger holiday was on Wednesday. That's really where the big holiday was, the big to do, the big thing that we should be grateful for. What was Wednesday? Do you know? All Saints Day. All Saints Day was, was Wednesday. And All Saints Day, you know what that means? Um, it's not just that we remember anybody that died. It's specifically. It's all Saints Day is specifically the day that we remember and that we give thanks for all the men and women who were part of this process. All the men and women that came before us who accepted the invitation to repent of their sins and trust Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and follow Him. All Saints Day is about remembering and giving thanks for the men and women that came before us that accepted the invitation, made a commitment to follow Jesus made a commitment to know Jesus and be known as His followers, made a commitment, right, made a commitment to then go and do something with their knowledge and experience, which means that these people, these people, because they were part of the process, somehow, some way, these people made that invitation to you and to me somewhere along the line. And I actually think we need to give God thanks for all the people, all the saints. Think about those saints. I think about my great-grandma Stella, my grandma Grace. I think about saints that have been part of churches that I've led as a pastor that have died. And um, I thank God for them. And again, I, I bring them up to say, this is how it works. We owe these saints, these saints, our gratitude and our thanks to God. Because if it wasn't for them, we probably wouldn't be here. And again, they illustrate this truth. They illustrate this truth that, that, that they somehow, some way, gave a first invitation to you, to me, right? Whether it was a parent or a grandparent or, 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 or an aunt or an uncle or a next door neighbor or a brother or a sister, a friend. It was somebody that invited you. It was somebody that had been part of this process of following Jesus and going and doing that invited you, Right? And maybe it was as simple as you're going, well, I don't know, I grew up across the street from the Methodist church. I guess that's how I got here. Somebody invited you. Somehow, some way, you were invited to Sunday school or vacation Bible school or to a church camp or you were invited to confirmation or you were invited to a worship celebration or you were invited to a Bible study or maybe your port of entry was you came to a fall family festival or maybe you came to a tractor pull because a lot of churches do those, right? Okay, that's a joke. That's the only one I've got. That's it. Point is, whatever the point of entry was, there was an invitation. There was an invitation, right? And that's why we say thank you to those people because if, if they hadn't made the invitation, somehow, some way, we may not be here doing our best to be the church and, and to follow, right? In fact, you know, All Saints Day always also pushes on this thing. Here's the big challenging thing that I always am confront. I'm always confronted with this, and I'm going to confront you with it, Okay? Is if in the same way, if we today are thinking about those people who 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 50 years ago, 70 years ago, whatever, were saints in our life, the Christian men and women who invited us and encouraged us to be Christians. It makes me wonder 30, 40, and 50 years from now, who's going to be remembering me? And who's going to be remembering you? That's the challenge of All Saints Day. 30, 20 years, 10 years when you're gone. 50 years when I'm gone, I plan to at least go that long. 50 years. It's on All Saints Day and the preacher says, let's remember our saints, those men and women who influenced us and got us into the Christian faith. Is anybody going to remember you or me? Because the whole point this illustrates is these people, these people worked the system. They worked the process. And that's why we're here. I realized this week in thinking about this, though, that one of the challenges we have in the Christian faith is that for many people, following stops. And that's why I tried to design this with this like brick wall, this wall here. I realized that one of the challenges we have in the church in North America when it comes to this process of invitation and following and knowing and being known by one another and, and knowing and, and Jesus and being known as his follower, and then going and doing something with it. I realize that one of the problems, one of the, one of the it's like a handicap that we have in North America, because it's easy to be a Christian in North America. Nobody's going to come into our house, arrest us, shoot us, or chase us down in the street yet, because we follow Jesus. But I realize that for many people, following, this idea of following, has come to mean something different than what I'm talking about. 
When I talk about following, it's all the things of the process. You get to know Jesus better, and you go and do, and you change the world and bring more heaven uh, to earth. For some people, though, for some people across North America, following has come to mean official church membership in a congregation of a particular denomination. And once the name's in the membership book, they equate that with following. Yeah, I follow Jesus. I'm a member of the church. I don't go. I mean, I do on Christmas and Easter if it works, if we're not out of town, if it's convenient. But I realize that for many people, now you're here, so I'm not talking to you probably. But for many people across North America and certainly here in Iowa, following, following's gotten kind of messed up. It's kind of like one of the laments, one of the laments that pastors have across denominations is we all lament and we, we, we get frustrated with the whole confirmation thing. That for many years, too many years, confirmation in many churches has meant graduation. It has meant that a sixth or a seventh grader goes through some classes and maybe they go on a retreat and, and they have to stand up and put on nice clothes and they get a certificate. And then the church never really sees them. They, they don't really participate in the process of following and knowing and learning and growing and then going and doing and inviting other people to be part of the process. They don't participate in that. For some people, you see, following in this process, and that's what I'm talking about. I want to clarify this. Here, here's what it's not. It's not what many people do. They get their name in the membership book of the church, right? And it's about having a place to worship when they want, if they're available. It's about having a place for Sunday school, drop the kids off at Sunday school. I'll go to Starbucks. I'll come and pick them up later. Pastor, church, make sure you give my kids some religion, right? For many people, it's come to mean a membership uh, name in a book so that when those big events of things like baptisms and weddings and funerals um, or hospitalizations come about, there's a clergy person on call standing by to do all those rites of passage, right? That's not what following is. But for many people in North America, maybe they haven't been told. We'll give them the benefit of the doubt. Maybe they haven't been challenged. Maybe it hasn't been explained that following Jesus and being a follower of His is more than just having your name in a membership book of a particular denomination. Right? Following, following means being actively actively participating in worship and in activities. It means, it means knowing. It means being available to really get to know and be known by other people in the congregation. It means, it means being in a discipleship journey. It means being in some kind of a small group, like a cell group or a Bible study or adult, Bible, uh, 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 adult uh, uh, Sunday school. It means some kind of, of knee-to-knee, face-to-face time that you're growing as a follower of Jesus. It means serving. It means serving in the name of Jesus Christ, not just hanging out waiting to be served. You see, when I look at that and say, folks, if you take that name, I'm a Christian, but they really aren't doing this. I think, well, that's not really, that's not really being a Jesus follower. It's more like functional atheism, right? Because Jesus isn't really part of your everyday life. And, and Jesus is just kind of an accessory to give you respectability, right? That's our challenge in North America. But you see, real biblical following is taking these next steps in the process. Real biblical following is being part of authentic Christian community, and it means some work. When Jesus called people to follow him, he, he didn't say, hey, this is going to be easy. This is going to be great. Your life is going to be like a bowl of cherries, man. You're never going to fall down. Your dog's never going to die. It's going to be great. He never said that. He said, if you follow me, you know, birds of the air have nests and foxes have holes, but I don't even have a place to lay my head. He said, people are going to persecute you. It's going to be tough. You've got to carry a cross. Wow. But you see, real biblical following, real biblical following are things like this. Preaching the gospel at all times and when necessary, use words, according to St. Francis of Assisi. Real biblical following, to go back to the process, it's knowing Jesus more and being known as his follower. And now I am talking to all of us in this room because you accepted the invitation to be here somehow, some way. And so now it's taking next steps and following. It's taking next steps together as a congregation to know and be known by one another. I take this very seriously. We need this. The world needs this more than ever. We don't want anybody to come in here and be like a lone ranger and feel like they're all alone. And then it's about going and doing, which includes inviting other people to begin the process. And I remind us, Jesus set this process in place to change the world, not me. Jesus put this process in place to change and to save the world. Because people, 
And because people followed and engaged in the process, the church exists. We are here because people engage in this process. Now, here's that next challenge. Who's going to come alongside of us and who's going to come after us? Who's going to come after us? Because it's that, that reality that we still talk about, that our world is on fire. The opening video we watched about the church that was inspiring, they made that point. And they said there are many, many needs in this world, and the church is uniquely equipped to meet them. Our world is on fire, and people are being burned up with all these kinds of things and more. Our world needs, really needs, Jesus. And that's what we can do about it. We can give and we can bring more of Jesus into this world. Not just me, not just a few of us, all of us. That's the call. That's the system. That's the process. That's the plan that God put into place. All of us are called to be engaged in the process of discipleship for ourselves and then somehow, some way, to invite other people into the process. That's as simple as I can make it. Does that make sense to everybody? Just say, yeah. It, we're called to be on a journey ourselves. We're called to engage in this process ourselves. But then we're called to invite other people to do it. You know, you know where the church, where, where we have to learn. And this week I took some time to ask a couple of people um, that work for this local company. Okay? Now, if you work for another, if you work for a bank, this is a credit union, as I was told, I was corrected, right? This is a credit union. I'm going to tell you a little bit about it. If you work for another bank or credit union, don't be upset. Well, Tom, you know, he's like political. He's trying to promote. Well, this is, great. This is our, where we do our financial services here. But here, more than that, this is a local company. And I learned a little bit of history about Dupaco. Is that it started with like five guys throwing in five bucks a piece uh, when the Dubuque Pack, the packing house, was downtown. And these guys opened the original, like the mothership, the original branch was on Sycamore Street. Okay? And I can't remember the, the date. It doesn't matter the date. Okay, But I wanted to find out about this because this is a local, successful organization and company, all right? And, and, and I'm kind of fascinated by it because, again, the point is, is the church needs to learn from. The church needs to learn from businesses, successful businesses. There's, there's nothing wrong with that. So I found out this was the beginnings of this thing right here in Dubuque, Iowa, right here in Dubuque, Iowa. And now they have 18 locations, 18 locations, all right? And so I was talking to RJ about this Wednesday night, and I was asking him questions about it, and I was talking to Greg Little a little bit about it. But I asked RJ, we were walking down the hall after spiritual gifts class, and I said, so basically all these different branches, all these different satellites, uh, 18 of them, they all kind of share some of the same values and some of the same DNA and some of those kinds of things. And RJ got so excited, Lynette, he took his hat off, and he was like, cool. It was cool. And, and let me give it verbatim, because then I checked with Greg about this the other day. I said, so basically what I, what I understand that the CEO, the big dog of Dupaco says is something like this. If we believe, if we believe what we do here at Dupaco, if we believe that it's a good thing, and if we believe that it helps people, then we need to expand and help more and more people, and that means go to other places. Is that about the gist of it? What do you think? Is that pretty commendable? I think it is. And if Dupaco, if Dupaco which is a, let's just put it this way, fair enough, they're a savings institution. Is that an okay way to describe them? If that savings institution has got that attitude, then this saving institution, which is the breathing, alive body of Jesus Christ here to save the world, I think we're the best savings institution. And if Dupaco's got this going on, why don't we? Can I get an amen? Uh-huh, uh-huh. Well, because it's scary. See, if we believe that Jesus Christ is the answer, if we believe that Jesus Christ is salvation, if we believe that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life to help a world that's on fire, if we believe this, that Jesus puts out the fires that consume people, then why wouldn't we be actively engaged in sharing? Why wouldn't we be? It's like that video we watched a couple weeks ago from Penn Gillette. How much do you have to hate somebody not to proselytize? Let me bring that back to my words. How apathetic do we need to be? How disinterested do we need to be that we're not willing to share Jesus? That we're not willing, that we're not willing to invite and to follow and to invite other people to follow and to know and be known. How selfish do we need to be that we just want to keep everything for us under this roof where it's nice and it's safe and there's no sacrifice, there's no challenge, there's no risk of failure or any of that other kind of stuff. See, this has been on my head and it's been on my heart for over eight years when I was first called to come to Dubuque, Iowa. When I came here, I had this, 
little nudging, little, little vision inside of me like, wow, there's all these United Methodist churches up here in Dubuque. Why aren't we doing more things together? And as the years have gone by, and as I've, I've watched us build what I think of as our base here, and as I've watched us here at Grandview run out of parking lot space, right, on many Sundays, as I've watched us grow to the point that on Sunday mornings, if we wanted to add another adult class or kids class or youth class, I'm not sure where they would go in this building. As I've watched all this and prayed and thought and looked and listened, I really believe, Grandview, that God is calling us to continue to be a strong, healthy base here of about 500 active, engaged Jesus followers. And then I believe that God is calling us to go into other parts of this city and to take what we have and what we do and what we believe in, that we're being called, and we need to get, like over the next year, we're going to start doing this. I believe we're being called to go in other parts of the city. And I'll say it again. If the Dupaco Credit Union gets this, why don't we? If the Dupaco Credit Union understands that if we have something good here, says Dupaco CEO, we have something beneficial here. We have something here that's going to help people. That's how, why it got started all those years ago. If they get that, why aren't we? And why aren't we doing it? Why aren't we doing it? So stay tuned. I'm not sure how this is going to play out. But church... God is calling us to do more than just take care of our own needs. God is calling each and every one of us with new invitations to follow and to know and be known even more, to know Jesus even more and to know one another even more. And then most importantly, we're called to go and do something with that. We're called to go and do something with our changed heads, changed hearts, changed habits, changed perspective. It starts, it starts with the invitation. Invitation. So I challenge you, challenge you and myself this week to invite, to invite. In fact, practically speaking, we even have cards you can pick up on the connection counter and you can give it to somebody, a family member, a friend, a coworker. It says, please join me for worship. Worship is just a port of entry. Invite. In fact, I think the world is counting on us. Whatever structure or form it takes, we are called to do this personally and to invite other people into the process to help save their lives. I'm going to end on more of an upbeat note here, reminding us about what we're supposed to do this week. Watch this. Amen. I want to invite us to be in prayer about that. Lord God, I pray once again, thank you that you've gathered us together and helped us to be part of your people. I thank you, Lord God, that you have a powerful source of energy, your Holy Spirit available to each and every one of us. I pray, Lord, that you forgive us for our sins today. And I pray that you help us to know that we're forgiven. And I pray, Lord God, that you raise us up and take us next steps. Take us next steps to knowing you, to loving you, and to following you for real. 
And I pray, Lord God, that you help us to be your ambassadors, that you help us to be your representatives wherever we find ourselves. Lord, we need your help to do this. I pray, Lord, that you continue to stir things up here, move us, scare us, so that we have to trust you. I pray all of this and that you make it happen in Jesus' name. And together we pray in one voice as one people the prayer Jesus taught us as we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever.